This program, written by Gary Allen, first appeared in American Opinion magazine. Mr. Allen is a graduate of Stanford University. He is the author of several best-selling books, including Communist Revolution in the Streets, Nixon's Palace Guard, None Dare Call It Conspiracy, and Richard Nixon, The Man Behind the Mask, The Definitive Study of the Ambition and Conspiratorial Activities of Our Recent President. Mr. Allen, a former instructor of history and English, is active in numerous humanitarian, anti-communist, and business enterprises. He is a film writer, author, and journalist. And above all, he is a contributing editor to American Opinion magazine. If you would like to receive American Opinion on a regular monthly basis, subscriptions may be obtained by writing to American Opinion, Belmont, Massachusetts, 02178. And now our program. The Looters, How Our Economy is Being Destroyed. When examining the sordid tapestry of our government's foreign and domestic policies since the termination of the Second World War, it is impossible to deny the pattern of systematic looting of the American economy. While one may debate the motivation of those who have woven the tapestry, no one can deny that the result is a masterpiece of intricate design. If this is all accident and happenstance, then so were the pyramids. If the past 30 years of America last policies are the product of collective mistakes by our liberals and misguided humanitarians, if all this be accident, it is time to conclude that at last the infinite number of monkeys pounding diligently on an infinite number of typewriters has produced a Shakespearean tragedy. One of the most obvious methods by which the insiders of the establishment have been looting our country for nearly three decades is the perpetual con game which operates under the euphemism of foreign aid. You may have heard the gallows jest that foreign aid is the refreshment that never pauses. And it is true. Americans have been pouring out foreign aid for so long that practically nobody realizes what the collective cost has been. Every year the Congress and the President stage a mock battle over whether the taxpayer will contribute foreign aid of 3.2 billion or 2.9 billion. And that debate is fought with all of the sincerity of a professional wrestling match. It is strictly gorgeous George versus the masked Marvel. Meanwhile, according to Chairman Otto Passman of the House Appropriations Subcommittee, which handles foreign aid, the cash pours out of some 28 falsely labeled spigots and the combined total is somewhere in the mind-boggling neighborhood of $18 billion per year. The advertised $3 billion is a mere diversion. Representative H.R. Gross, the retiring fiscal watchdog of the Congress, reported that the total cost of our foreign aid program as of July 1973 was $225 billion. And by July 1974, the cost passed $250 billion. The giveaway total accounts for over half of our staggering national debt, a debt near the half trillion dollar mark, and totaling $60 billion more than the combined public debt of all the other countries of the world. So carefully disguised has this looting of America been, that the sensational total of the foreign giveaway racket never became known until March 6, 1973, when the Statistics and Reports Division of the Office of Financial Management of the Agency for International Development was forced to reveal it in a remarkable report. It was compiled and made public at last because conservative congressmen had added Section 657 to the 1971 Foreign Aid Act requiring that all foreign aid spending by all federal agencies be recorded in a single document. Prior to 1973, the propagandists and bureaucrats promoting foreign giveaways had concealed the full extent of their racket by hiding it under a variety of captions in many different departments and agencies. They were so reluctant to comply with the new section that it took them from June 1972 until March 1973 to produce the report. Foreign aid operations include pumping the lifeblood of our economy into 99 nations, some 95% of whom were neutral or on the other side of the Vietnam War. So much for the liberal rationalization that we are buying friends and loyalty. 
According to Congressman Passman, quote, of the 3.5 billion people of the world, all but 36 million have received aid from the United States, end quote. Apparently, the remaining 36 million are so deeply lost in remote jungles or inaccessible mountains that our politicians and bureaucrats could not find them to shower them with our taxes. Foreign aid operations for which you pay include more than 4,000 separate projects and employ 51,000 Americans and foreigners. A more or less typical example of how the government shovels out our dollars for foreign aid is the nearly $10 billion we have bestowed upon India, whose Marxist premier has vehemently accused the United States of being responsible for her aggressive war against Pakistan and even intimated that the CIA was somehow behind cyclones striking the coast from the Bay of Bengal. India is today as much a Soviet satellite as Cuba, Syria, and Iraq. While sanctimoniously proclaiming her neutralism, she has been armed to the teeth by Russia. Hundreds of millions of rubles in late model Soviet planes, tanks, guns, and other combat hardware were shipped to India in recent years. Thousands of Indian pilots and other military personnel were trained in Russia. India has even gone so far as to provide the Soviets with military and submarine bases. Yet, America continues to pour good money down the Indian rat hole, and we mean rat hole quite literally. Each year, America sends millions of bushels of subsidized wheat to India, a quantity equal to about the same tonnage of grain as that eaten by the Indian rats. You see, the rat gobbling up American wheat might be the reincarnation of dearly departed Uncle Sabu, who was working his way back up the ladder of reincarnation to become a human being again in, say, 2250 A.D. So, rats each year consume millions of bushels of extremely scarce food in India, and the American taxpayer is expected to fill the gap. Should you be such a cretin as to opine that since that is their philosophy, they should change it, or learn to live with it, you will find yourself denounced as a chauvinist Christian. After all, who are we to try to evangelize the world? Ours is not to reason why, ours is but to pay, and pay, and pay. Meanwhile, the big rip-off continues. On January 31, 1974, word reached Washington that U.S. Ambassador Daniel P. Moynihan had wiped out over two billion dollars of the 3.3 billion dollars in debts owed to the United States by India. Uncle Sam loses again because, you see, the game is fixed. As Congressman Passman grimly notes, quote, the United States cannot survive as a strong nation if we continue to dissipate our resources and give away our wealth to countries all over the world, end quote. Foreign aid has been used to slash our fiscal artery. Not only has the wound gushed out $250 billion of the taxpayer's blood, it has, by doubling our national debt, fostered the inflation, which is each year robbing the American people of tens of billions of dollars in purchasing power. As you may know, the national debt is funded by government bonds, which are used by the Federal Reserve and the banking system as the basis for creating new money, inflating our money supply just as more air blows a balloon bigger and bigger until it bursts. The more foreign aid, the more national debt. The more national debt, the more money there is. The more money printed, the less each dollar is worth, and the more the cost of living skyrockets. As they say in the song, you can't have one without the other. Recently, the director of the Graduate Institute of International Studies at Farley Dickinson University wrote an article with the wonderful title, quote, Foreign Band Aid, end quote, in which he observed, Congress is again going through the annual ritual of debating foreign aid. Many people all over the United States are asking, can this country afford to spend billions each year on international welfare, which has brought us nothing but woe, wars, and economic trouble? Was the purpose of aid to contain communism? Since its inception, the number of people under communist regimes has grown sevenfold. 
If our goal was stability, the last 25 years have witnessed 35 wars, civil wars, and revolutions, with 40 million refugees and 10 million casualties, of which 1 million were Americans. If our aim was to help the poor, our aid has made the rich richer and the poor poorer. Most aid money is deposited in the Swiss bank accounts of the international Al Capones, who in gratitude for our generosity send us heroin and opium. During the last 25 years, while our gold reserve dropped from 25 to 10 billion dollars and the deficit in our balance of payments soared to 60 billion dollars, the Germans and the Japanese have accumulated 40 billion dollars in gold and dollars. This ends the quotation from the article Foreign Band Aid. What occurred was that over a period of years, the United States ran up huge balance of payments deficits, largely because of foreign aid. Foreign nations found themselves with 70 to 90 billion dollars in their central banks, 15 billion dollars of which were gradually exchanged for gold. As you know, Americans were not allowed to exchange their dollars for gold, so our supply of the precious metal was looted by foreigners who held our aid dollars. Finally, the United States slammed shut the window, lest foreign central banks walk off with every last glittering ounce of our gold. So, now that they can no longer turn in their dollars for gold, foreigners, especially the Japanese and Arabs, are buying property and securities in America. But all of that gold that we let go overseas at $35 an ounce is now worth over $150 on the open market. In other words, the $15 billion in gold that went that away is now worth $75 billion, almost five times as much. Had we not been looted of 60% of our gold, the United States would have $125 billion in gold reserves at free market prices with which to back the United States currency. The dollar would be truly almighty in the marketplaces of the world. Instead, Monetary conspirators have wholesaled our gold at bargain basement prices to strengthen foreign currencies and build foreign economies at the expense of our own currency, foreign trade, and economy. The total indirect damage done to the United States by the looting that is foreign aid is probably incalculable. But if you consider the consequences of the inflation it has created, the cost has run into the hundreds of billions of dollars. Since foreign aid is responsible for half of our increasingly astronomical national debt, for instance, we are paying $15 billion per year just in interest on the money that our politicians gave away. From here, the plot sickens. Instead of digging ourselves out from under past mistakes, the Nixon administration had been stoking the socialist steam shovels to turn us ever deeper into the pits of collectivism. The looting of America is not being supervised by vandals, Huns, or even the once feared Visigoths, but by American politicians, international bankers, and arrogant bureaucrats in Brooks Brothers suits. An increasingly important tool for the looting of America is the Export-Import Bank, known as XM Bank. It was established in 1934. But it wasn't until Richard Nixon signed a presidential determination on October 18, 1972, that the XM Bank began to finance trade with the Soviets. During its first 25 years, it had carefully authorized some $10 billion in credits for 1,600 projects in 69 countries, mostly in Latin America. And then, with the launching of the Marshall Plan following World War II, the XM Bank extended its activities into Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. During 1973, it pumped out $2.4 billion in loan guarantees. The process by which the XM Bank works is simple enough. A U.S. exporter goes to his own bank, which makes arrangements for the XM Bank to loan money to the exporter's foreign buyer. XM Bank then grants a credit to the American bank, which pays the U.S. exporter. Thus, the exporter is immediately paid in inflationary deficit dollars. The American bank is cut in on the deal, and the foreign importer gets a subsidized interest rate. Who pays the interest subsidy? You hardly need ask. The U.S. taxpayer pays it through treasury grants to the XM Bank. 
Thus, the Ex-Im Bank has been making loans to foreigners at 6% when the prime rate is 10%. The difference is a 4% subsidy to any foreigner who buys our goods. General Thomas Lane comments, quote, Why is the prime rate at 10%? When Congress is depreciating the dollar at 5% per year, you have to charge 10% to make 5 If a buyer borrows dollars at 6% for five years, and in that period the dollar has depreciated 25%, the buyer has only paid 1% per year for his loan. End quote. What happens if the foreign buyer defaults? Auf Wiedersehen. Adios. Sayonara. If the customer sneaks out of the restaurant without paying the check, the waiter puts the arm on, that's right, the American taxpayer, who once again picks up the tab. How would you like to be in a business in which the government paid you in full for all sales and accepted the responsibility for collecting all accounts receivable? As General Lane notes, quote, In this system, the U.S. exporter has nothing to lose by sales to bad credit risks. The United States Commercial Bank has nothing to lose. The inclination, therefore, under our profit system is to sell products to anyone who will sign a loan agreement which you can run by the XM Bank. Irresponsibility is rewarded. It is an old story. Public money is nobody's money. As a sense of civic responsibility declines, the public money is used to private advantage. But more than that, the reckless profligacy of the Congress in providing funds for such purposes undermines the sense of civic virtues in our government. End quote. As with other free enterprises, we favor foreign trade. But when the great American exporters ask the taxpayers to take the risks while they take a guaranteed profit, it is no longer trade, but looting. It is no different than if you were an automobile dealer selling cars to deadbeats in Chad and asking the taxpayers to pick up the payments. Assuredly, you could sell lots of Cadillacs that way. You could, in fact, loot our country of every Cadillac that could be made and you wouldn't care a fig whether the customer ever pays for the car. Once again, we quote Thomas Lane, quote, In this operation, the inside operators of international trade have arranged a bonanza for themselves at the expense of the defenseless taxpayer. Whatever the Depression purposes may have been in the 30s, the bank has long outlived its usefulness. Let our private bankers set up their own export-import bank and charge an adequate interest rate to cover the risks involved. Let them depend on their own judgment of who is entitled to credit. Congress should close the bank forthwith, putting industry on notice that there will be no loans or guarantees after fiscal year 1974, end quote. Well, that's what ought to be done. But just the opposite is happening. The Exim Bank is being bloated with a tremendous expansion of loans, primarily to the communists, the world's worst deadbeats. Shortly after the May 1972 Moscow summit, the Nixon administration began pushing to extend the credit of the United States taxpayers directly to the Soviets. As part of the Nixon-Kissinger detente, Congress was to extend to the Bolsheviks tariff status as a most favored nation and XM Bank loans were to be arranged for the transfer of the most advanced American technology to Russia and for the development of Soviet energy sources. The sluice gates for loans have been opened. A legal counselor for XM Bank has charged the bank's directors with approving bad loans under pressure from the White House and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. As part of the massive effort to build the communist economy by looting the United States on credit, Richard Nixon appointed William Casey to be president of the Export-Import Bank. Casey is a member of the Rockefeller-controlled Council on Foreign Relations, which has as its goal the creation of a world government. A longtime leftist, he was first named an Undersecretary of State to hustle red trade. At the time, Mr. Casey was described by national security expert Frank Capel as follows, quote, under State Department security of the Uptepka era, it is very doubtful that William Casey would have been granted clearance. His past known associations with communists in Europe, his questionable financial dealings, and his pro-Soviet outlook 
would have raised many questions about the propriety of his holding a position as Under Secretary of State. End quote. But, of course, Casey was the perfect man for the job that Nixon, Kissinger, and the international bankers had in mind. As part of his goal of promoting trade with the communists, William Casey told the Society of American Business Writers, quote, To implement this vital aspect of our overall foreign policy, our ambassadors to communist nations have been instructed to put trade promotion at the top of their list of priorities. Shortly, we will have doubled the number of State Department employees serving in commercial positions in the USSR, Eastern Europe, and China. End quote. Naturally, the communists are delighted to have the American super capitalists build factories for them as long as the American taxpayers agree to pick up the tab when the commissars default. It is foreign aid in a big way. The first of the giant projects we are inflating our currency to build on credit for the communists is the Kama River factory, which is to be the largest producer of trucks in the world. But please try not to mention that trucks are the backbone of modern military operations and that truck factories build tanks during wartime. The Kama River factory will produce 150,000 heavy trucks and 150,000 heavy engines per year more than the combined output of such trucks by all American factories. And the complex is being built by a division of the Pullman Company at a cost of two billion dollars. The Soviets are going to put up 10 percent of the cash for the project, while David Rockefeller's Chase Manhattan Bank and the Export-Import Bank will each put up 45 percent. According to U.S. News and World Report of March 25, 1974, quote, Chase experts see Kama River as a billion-dollar beginning for U.S. suppliers, end quote. Other U.S. corporations involved include General Motors, Rockwell International, IBM, Honeywell, Westinghouse Electric, U.S. Industries, and Ingersoll Rand. To say that Exim Bank is bending over backwards to accommodate the Soviets with the taxpayers' dollars is the equivalent of saying that J. Paul Getty is moderately certain that his personal check won't bounce. The length of XM's usual loans range from three to five or seven years. The repayment period for this loan is 12 years, with a grace period of four and a half years, which means that it will be 16 and a half years, if ever, before anyone sees the first payment. I try to get that kind of a deal as an American businessman at 6% interest. And what happens when the comrades don't pay? Do we foreclose and repossess the factory? That's about as practical as growing bananas in Minnesota. Krupp, the German industrial giant, has already experienced a near collapse as a result of its dealings with the Soviets and had to be bailed out by its government. But, you say, Surely David Rockefeller, the shrewdest and most powerful banker in the world, would not risk Chase Manhattan's money unless he were sure of repayment. You're right. David is sure of repayment. Chase's loan is guaranteed by the U.S. taxpayer through other government agencies called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and the Foreign Credit Insurance Association. The U.S. taxpayer is on the hook for every dime. Just as with the Exim Bank loans, OPIC and FCIA guarantee the businessman a profit no matter how bad the deal turns out. What is happening is that we are giving the Soviets a $2 billion truck plant and ensuring the Rockefellers a cut on the interest of a loan that the American taxpayers will pay when the comrades decide, after 16 and a half years, to thumb their noses at us and the Kama River project kicked off a spree of such looting. One of these loans was for $36 million to help construct and equip an international trade center in Moscow. Joint venturing in this deal, all fully guaranteed by you, are Chase Manhattan and the Bank of America. Arranged by Armand Hammer of Occidental Petroleum, a personal friend of Lenin and a son of a founder of the U.S. Communist Party, the huge trade center will be built by the Bechtel Corporation. Comrade Hammer and his Occidental Petroleum also have a huge natural gas deal in the mill with the Soviets. According to former Exim Bank boss Henry Carnes, quote, 
for a proposed gas development deal in Siberia that the Soviets are eager to make, the required Exim Bank credit is $1.5 billion more than the bank has granted any other customer. The Soviet Union has already received Exim credits of about $350 million without disclosing financial data. End quote. The Nixon administration also helped to inflate our currency by lending the Soviet Union $180 million at 6% interest to provide and construct on a Soviet site a new fertilizer plant made in the USA. This, incidentally, came at a time when America was in the midst of a severe fertilizer shortage. Crops were being limited in our own country because of that shortage. But our government was concerning itself with the expansion of Soviet food supplies and looting us of the hardware to build this desperately needed fertilizer plant. According to Congressman Charles Vanek, quote, Incidentally, the cost of the Russian fertilizer plant will be $400 million. Of this, the Soviet Union is putting up only $40 million, a mere 10% of the cost. All the rest will come from the U.S. In addition to the Export-Import Bank's loan, private American banks will lend another $180 million for the Russian plant, but at a realistic 10 to 12 percent interest. The American taxpayer is therefore subsidizing the Export-Import Bank's part of the loan, a subsidy that could cost between 50 and $75 million in lost interest over the 12-year period of the loan." End quote. Moreover, continues Congressman Vanek, the loan agreement provides that the private American banks will get all their money back before any payments are made on the Export-Import Bank's portion of the loan. So, under this arrangement, the private banks get almost double the interest rate of the Export-Import Bank and dispose of their risk six years in advance of the Export-Import Bank. These policies of the bank are financial madness. The American taxpayer should not be made to support an interest dole of such dimensions." End quote. The C.E. Loomis Company of Bloomfield, New Jersey, has agreed to build a $105 million petrochemical plant in the Ukraine. Under the terms of the contract, the Soviets will spend $60 million erecting buildings and infrastructure, while the Loomis Company will provide $45 million in technology, equipment, and engineering design for the plant. Also involved in the deal is the Monsanto Company, which will make available its new method of producing acetic acid. The XM Bank is inflating our currency for $20 million of financing, while private banks are putting up another $20 million, guaranteed by the taxpayers through OPIC. Once more, we are looted for a major productive facility and forced to pay for it in inflation. Alice Chalmers, on September 18, 1973, announced that it had received a $35 million contract to build an iron ore pelletizing plant in the Soviet Union. According to United Press International, quote, the plant will use a special pelletizing process developed by Alice Chalmers and will have a production capability of 18,180 tons of pellets per day, end quote. It will be one of the four largest of its type in the world, and the equipment to be used in the new Soviet plant will include some of the most advanced in the technology of converting iron ore into pellets, which are used for steel making. How much of this project is being bankrolled by Exim Bank was not announced, but nobody in America is risking building something for the Soviets without Exim Bank and or OPIC guarantees. According to Nelson Rockefeller, Alcoa, the Aluminum Company of America, is going to build an aluminum plant for the Reds which, quote, would consume half the world's supply of bauxite, end quote. No other details, to our knowledge, have been made public on this deal, but dozens, possibly hundreds, of other looting deals are in the wind, and your taxes are being pledged to guarantee it all. As Professor Anthony Sutton of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University has observed, quote, these negotiations are always conducted in the utmost secrecy, and you usually don't learn about them until they are a fait accompli. I have requested a list of applications on file for loans to the Soviets from the XM Bank and have been refused." End quote. Little wonder, given the size of the looting being done. It wasn't long ago that General Motors was recognized as a synonym for the responsible conservatism of American business. 
no more. According to the New York Times of September 22, 1973, quote, the Soviet Union has started preliminary talks with General Motors in hopes of convincing the United States automaker to build a billion-dollar truck factory in Siberia. Its cost has been put at about two billion dollars. Sources said the Soviets were interested in a so-called turnkey plant in Siberia, one in which the foreign general contractor turns over the key to the Russians after completion." End quote. The only available workforce for such a plant in Siberia would be slave labor. Yet Russia is crawling with American businessmen, now including the executives of General Motors, who are falling all over themselves in their eagerness to scalp a fast buck by building slave factories for the Soviets or selling them some sophisticated equipment to enhance the Soviet military-industrial complex. The Washington Post's Murray Seeger writes, quote, The same week that American and Russian armed forces were on alert for possible action in the Middle East, nearly 2,000 American businessmen were showing their wares in Moscow at one of the biggest U.S. trade shows ever held in Eastern Europe. Significantly, the show displayed American technology for developing oil and gas supplies at a time when Arab petroleum shipments were being reduced. So many Americans showed up for the exhibit that Moscow's hotels for foreigners were jammed. A government-sponsored Congress of Peace Forces took over the city's biggest hotel, so Americans were forced to sleep three and four in a room. On one day, 150 Americans arrived at the airport to find the Soviet travel agency in tourist had only one available room. Soviet visitors to the capital with lower priorities were installed in four river boats on the Moscow River and other lesser hostelries during that week." End quote. Many of these men clamoring around the Kremlin are believed by the unsophisticated to be conservatives. What is the public to think when E. Douglas Kenna, president of the National Association of Manufacturers, is reported to have told Soviet trade officials that, quote, the NAM would work with our U.S. trade associations to gain congressional approval of most favored nation tariff treatment for the Soviet Union, unquote. Congressman John Ashbrook comments acidly, quote, businessmen who seek to flee American labor and to support a slave labor totalitarian dictatorship for monetary profit while praising the glories of a free market can do two things have the decency to stop biting the conservative hands that allow them to feed here and in Russia, and stop associating themselves in the public's mind with conservatism." End quote. Alfred R. Wentworth, senior vice president of Chase Manhattan Bank and head of Chase's recently opened Moscow office, has stated, quote, The Soviet Union is the last great undeveloped market for the United States. It now is opening up and our bank wants to participate in the many opportunities being created." End quote. Mr. Wentworth terms this the year of the American in the Soviet Union. United States trade with the Soviets reached a record $642 million in 1972, and then passed $1 billion in 1973. All predictions are that the looting will continue to skyrocket in 1974 and 1975. Soviet officials are optimistic too. Nikolai N. Smelyakov, Deputy Minister for Foreign Trade of the Soviet Union, states, The trade potential between the Soviet Union and America is substantial, and we are experiencing no difficulties at all in obtaining credits for our trade." End quote. Yuri I. Bobrikov, chief researcher at the Soviet Institute for the Study of the United States, says, quote, Judging from the scale and rate of increase of the trade, the U.S. may become the leading non-socialist trade partner for the Soviet Union within another year or two. End quote. One would think that the energy shortage in America might have slowed the flow of money, materials, and technology to the Soviet Union. Congressman John Ashbrook investigated and reported, quote, with the United States facing a serious energy shortage, you would expect that American equipment and supplies would be going to develop new oil and gas resources inside the United States. This assumption is logical, but it is wrong. According to Leo Welt, who conceived and ran a recent trade show in Moscow, 
U.S. petroleum equipment and service suppliers already are on their way towards selling a billion dollars worth of such items for use in the USSR oil and gas activities. These items include many thousands of tons of pipeline coating sold by Kendall Polychem, $42 million worth of crawler tractors by International Harvester for pipeline construction, and three and a half million dollars for exploration items by Halliburton Wellex and Dresser Industries. Perhaps after we have finished developing the Soviet economy, we can turn to our own needs." End quote. While our government was financing the shipment of scarce oil drilling equipment to the Soviet Union, it kept on the price controls in the United States. Tens of thousands of desperately needed oil wells were not drilled in this country because of what Business Week of December 8, 1973 called a severe shortage of drilling pipe and well casing. Because of Mr. Nixon's price controls, much of that pipe was being exported at fat world prices. During the oil boycott, more pipe needed to drill wells in the United States was bought up by the Arabs. Energy crisis, anyone? So blatant is this looting that the liberal commentator John P. Roche has compared Moscow's manipulation of American businessmen to rolling a drunk. Mr. Roche writes, quote, Does anybody really appreciate the cosmic irony involved in the present deals between the Soviet government and various American manufacturers? At the American end, the enterprise is justified by everybody from Secretary of State Henry Kissinger down as a technique of cementing political relations. The theory is that once the Russians get thoroughly dependent on us for spare parts, their ideological compulsions will wither away. In short, the American protagonists have adopted the quintessentially Marxist logic that economic relationships determine the behavior of political superstructures. As the United States Chamber of Commerce prepares to hang a portrait of Karl Marx over the mantel in the director's room, that's right, the Soviet spokesmen are busy asserting the primacy of political power. In this, they can draw sustenance from Lenin's 1921 New Economic Policy and from his improvisation of a category known as progressive capitalists. Lenin, who never let little theoretical problems interfere, kept assuring his distressed colleagues, notably the compulsively abstract Trotsky, that if it ever came to the crunch, the Bolsheviks could seize the foreign assets. That is, Lenin asserted the supremacy of the political over the economic relationship. End quote from Mr. Roche. And when the crunch came, the assets were seized, just as they will be again. When that happens, the American taxpayers will pick up the tab, and the result will be that we will have massively inflated our currency and looted America to give the Soviets, as foreign aid, the greatest military industrial complex on earth. At one time it was illegal for reasons of national defense to ship strategic materials or advanced technology to the Soviet Union. Then, during the LBJ era of bridge building, the restrictions were shredded. What little was left on the list was decimated by the Nixinger regime so that we are now openly sending the Soviets everything but atom bombs and we are working out details to provide them with nuclear reactors. There is virtually nothing we have for which the Soviets cannot loot us on the sneak-away plan. We are even going so far as to replace the backbone of the Soviet computer system, the Abacus, with our most sophisticated computers. In an article entitled, The Great Bleep Forward, Time of July 16, 1973, quoted Wade Holland, editor of Rand Corporation's Soviet Cybernetics Review as stating, quote, the Soviet computer industry has always been a shambles, end quote. Now, time continues, quote, Control Data Corporation has delivered the largest Western machine in the Soviet Union, a Model 6200, now at the Dubna Research Institute. The company is negotiating the setting up of a time-sharing network in Russia. Honeywell's French-based subsidiary has just installed an automated record-keeping system at the Goss Bank in Leningrad. Last May, IBM sold a computerized reservation system to Intourist, and the Soviet's new Ryad series is designed to be compatible with IBM peripheral equipment and software. U.S. businessmen who deal regularly with the USSR 
say that IBM is engaged in a new round of secret talks with the Soviets, but IBM executives will not confirm it. Honeywell men are negotiating with the Soviets and expect to open a Moscow office soon. In the past, the U.S. government has blocked sales of many high technology items like computers to the Soviet Union if it appeared that national defense might be compromised. In the rosy afterglow of the Nixon-Brezhnev summit, U.S. computer men are hoping President Nixon will relax the embargo. End quote from time. Needless to say, at the same time he was proposing the largest military budget in peacetime history, Richard Nixon relaxed the embargo. Human Events of March 9, 1974 reported, quote, Kissinger is now considering sending the Russians high-grade computers, the 6600 series. While these computers could be used for commercial purposes, technical experts stress that they also will have considerable military value and can be used in improving Soviet missiles, MIRV technology, and exotic guidance systems, end quote. Benjamin Schemmer of Armed Forces Journal indicates just how far we are going to build up the Soviet capacity to destroy us. As he writes in that periodical for February 1974, quote, The Soviet Union wants United States help to build a commercial jet aircraft complex in Russia that would employ over 80,000 people, three times the commercial airplane labor force at Boeing or McDonnell Douglas. Export of American know-how to build the multi-plant Russian complex is one of several conditions laid down by Soviet negotiators as a prerequisite for buying up to 30 wide-bodied U.S. jet transports, a sale U.S. firms are generally anxious to make. Russia has been discussing the potential $500 million deal with McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, and Lockheed since October of 1973. Russian negotiators have pegged annual output of the proposed new Soviet plant at over 100 planes. And this would equal almost half of all the commercial transports built by the United States in 1972 and more than a third of all large U.S. jet transports delivered last year. End quote. Jet transports, of course, are essential to modern warfare. We might as well negotiate to build them the world's largest tank factory. On the other hand, that is what the Kama River is all about, isn't it? Schemmer continues, quote, Noting that a modern transport aircraft is one of the most complex products in our economy, another company chairman says that if the USSR were to acquire, in the form of broad technical assistance for licensed production of our latest commercial jet transports, and the technology transfer inherent in providing with a turnkey aviation complex, our primary remaining element of dominance in the field of aviation would vanish." End quote. What is going on here, in short, is not only looting, but treason. Constructing some of the world's largest factories for the Soviet Union and shipping the communists the most sophisticated United States technology and equipment has a multitude of implications. Professor Antony Sutton, the world's foremost expert on the use of Western technology to develop the Soviet Union, has written an entire book on this subject, giving it the provocative title, National Suicide. The military potential of the industrial plants which we are building for the Soviet should be obvious to anyone. Trucks, aircraft, oil, steel, petrochemicals, aluminum, computers. These are the very sinews of a military industrial complex. These factories, the product of American genius and financed by American capital, could have been built in the United States. Instead, they are constructed at the U.S. taxpayers' expense in the Soviet Union, a nation whose masters will keep millions in concentration camps and who have sworn to bury us. True, the liberal establishment tells us that the Soviet leaders are only kidding when they tell their own people that they are accepting American aid in order to become strong enough to destroy us. But it is unlikely that Communist Party boss Leonid Brezhnev was jesting in June of 1971 when he declared in Moscow, Quote, there is no lull, there can be no lull on the ideological front. That war continues and will continue until the complete victory of communism. End quote. Yet the program to loot America to build the Soviet Union is escalating. And remember that the factories we are constructing for the communists represent the latest in American technology. This technology is unobtainable anywhere else in the world. 
As Professor Sutton observes, quote, an American corporation may spend decades and millions of dollars developing a particular process or perfecting some new machine and then transfer it in toto to the Soviet Union, end quote. This research and development has taken place with tax-deductible dollars, once again leaving the American taxpayer to foot the bill for the looting. Another important thing to remember is the strong possibility that Russian factories using American capital and American technology will, with Soviet slave labor, produce goods which in world markets will undersell those produced by American labor. Just as many thousands of Americans have already lost their jobs to foreign labor working in European and Asian factories constructed with American foreign aid, still more American workers will be put out of work by their own government. In fact, that is just what our runaway capitalists have in mind. A report by Senator Frank Church of the July 16, 1971 meeting between himself, David Rockefeller, and Soviet Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin includes the following, quote, Mr. Rockefeller commented that a U.S. firm would expect to make a profit on its investment. Would that be possible? Kosygin saw no reason why it couldn't be arranged. The U.S. firm would get the product at an agreed price in exchange for services rendered, building the plant, providing technical and managerial know-how, and then sell the product on the world market at whatever price it desired or could obtain, end quote. The profit advantage is all in slave labor, a product of which Senator Church and banker Rockefeller apparently approve. For the American workers, paying for these deals with their taxes, it means job suicide. Already, American trade with and construction in the Soviet satellites at this juncture outstrips that with the Moscow slave master. And it is no small potatoes. While the United States is in the throes of an electricity shortage, Westinghouse Electric and General Electric are proceeding with plans to build a $250 million nuclear power plant in communist Yugoslavia. Again, suicide. General Tire is building a $75 million radial tire factory in communist Romania with an option to purchase an equity position in the venture that would assure it the pricing benefits of slave labor. Control Data Corporation is building a $2.2 million plant in Bucharest, Romania to make computers and will keep a 45% interest in the deal. Computers do not distinguish between military and civilian inputs, by the way. Swindell Dressler, the division of the Pullman Company, which is the prime contractor on the Kama River project, is constructing a $42 million foundry in communist Poland, hard metal for the great Polish arms factories. Westinghouse Electric Corporation has signed a $10 million contract to design and equip an advanced electronics manufacturing plant near Warsaw, electronics for modern arms. The Corning Glass Company will equip a highly automated light bulb factory in communist Hungary, capable of producing one and a half million light bulbs a day, slave labor competition for American industry, and on and on. Meanwhile, so-called clean or low sulfur coal is being shipped from the United States to communist Romania and Yugoslavia while the American steel industry is in desperate need of such fuel. According to syndicated columnist Victor Rizel, quote, So acute is Bethlehem Steel's need for this low sulfur coal, it is cutting back hot metal production by a million tons in the next six months. It's not that Bethlehem, U.S. Steel, Republic Steel at all, refuse to pay. The government won't allow them. Professor Dunlop's sagacious appearing cost of living council has clamped a ceiling on what the American steel industry can pay. But there are no price controls on coal exported to Europe, Asia, and Latin America, nor are there price controls on what the American mine operators can charge electric power utilities. All other metallurgical coal lies under the price ceiling. So, the United States steel industry lies under a pall. Some now live a hand-to-furnace-mouth existence. Few have more than dangerously short supplies of this special coal." End quote. Having carefully arranged to commit suicide by firing the communist furnaces while our own are cold, to rebuild Russian tanks and Russian planes and the Russian nuclear industry, and to feed the Russian bear, 
it is obviously time to provide for the Chinese dragon. According to the Los Angeles Times of December 17, 1973, the Red Chinese are just dying to do business with genuine, bona fide American capitalists. And just as with the USSR, the number one hustler of trade with Mao Land is David Rockefeller, the super capitalist who is promoting a socialist world government. In fact, it was shortly after David Rockefeller gave a press conference in Hong Kong advocating trade with the Red Chinese that Nixon and Kissinger trotted off to see Mao in what amounted to a trade mission. That kicked open the door. Now, Chase Manhattan has become the official correspondent bank for the Red Chinese government. To help arrange the looting of our economy for the benefit of Comrade Mao, David Rockefeller has formed the National Council for U.S. Red China Trade. In addition to Rockefeller, the council is composed of Gabriel Hogg, Manufacturers Hanover Trust of New York, W.M. Blumenthal, Bendix Corporation, Southfield, Michigan, John W. Hanley, Monsanto Chemicals, St. Louis, Donald Burnham, Westinghouse Electric of Pittsburgh, Thornton Wilson, Boeing Aircraft of Seattle, William Hewitt, Deere and Company of Moline, Illinois, and Lucian Pye of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Rockefeller, Haig, Blumenthal, Hewitt, and Pye are all members of the Corporate Socialist Council on Foreign Relations. Little wonder, with such promoters fronting the show, that the Canton Trade Fair recently drew 250 U.S. business executives. Says David Rockefeller, quote, You must remember, the Chinese are not only purposeful and intelligent, they also have a large pool of cheap labor. So they should be able to find ways to get trading capital, end quote. If wages are low behind the Iron Curtain in Europe, imagine how attractive they are in Red China. Such things are not missed by David Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller is also in the oil business, and he apparently has big things in mind for his new friends in Peking. Robert S. Elegant writes in the Los Angeles Times of May 20th, 1973, quote, China and the United States are actively negotiating for cooperative exploitation of massive underseas oil reserves along the People's Republic's east and southeast coasts, authority of sources have revealed. Long-term development of those resources, which are believed to exceed all the world's presently known reserves, will not only cement the Sino-American relationship, but will also radically alter the present world balance of power. The sources indicated that the oil resources joint exploitation would be the cornerstone of continuing and closer relationship between Peking and Washington, a relationship not merely economic, but political. Only the United States possesses the deep water technology and engineering hardware to sink wells in the 400 to 700 foot depths where most of the oil lies. Although China's total reserves are not yet known precisely, American interest centers on the undersea oil rather than the land fields. As early as 1968, preliminary surveys conducted by the American oceanographic ship Hunt concluded that the reserves were massive. Both political and commercial reticence have kept confidential the specific conclusions of subsequent exploration, but their results are, in the words of one authority, breathtaking. During that period, five years to get into production, the United States and China would be linked by common interests that far outweigh the differences between the two capitals. End quote from Mr. Elegant. Meanwhile, Mao and company are flying Boeing 707 airplanes and dealing with United Aircraft for heavy-duty helicopters similar to those used by the U.S. military. United Aircraft is also negotiating to sell $100 million worth of the helicopters to Communist Romania and Lockheed has just signed a protocol with the Soviets to build helicopters for the comrades. Standard Oil of Ohio has signed an agreement with the Red Chinese to supply them with the acrylonitril production process necessary to manufacture the basic material in acrylics, orlon, and other man-made fibers. Giving that process to Red China, where slave labor is available in the hundreds of millions, should about finish the markets of the American garment industry. 
The U.S. government has already given a major shot in the arm to Mao's textile industries by providing cotton, subsidized by the American taxpayers. In 1973, the Red Chinese bought, on the looters' sneak-away plan, some 755,000 bales of U.S. cotton. According to the Kansas City Times of August 21, 1973, this was equivalent to the amount of cotton exported to all countries during the previous year. Little wonder, with such massive looting, that the price Americans must pay for cotton garments, sheets, and fabrics has skyrocketed. Meanwhile, the ubiquitous Pullman Company has received five contracts valued at $130 million to construct large ammonia plants in Red China on credit. A satellite corporation of Pullman has been awarded Red Chinese contracts for looting America, again on credit guaranteed by the U.S. taxpayer, of eight synthetic fertilizer plants. And so it goes. Besides looting our technology to assure industrialization of the communists, our government is also committed to looting our farms to feed the masses in the various workers' paradises. The great grain robbery has become so notorious that it has few defenders outside of the Nixon administration and the officers of the international grain companies who made fortunes on the steel. Throughout the entire summer of 1972, U.S. government officials, supposedly unaware of the extent of Russian purchases, blissfully encouraged the sale of 400 million bushels of American grain by maintaining prices artificially low through payment to exporters of some $300 million of tax subsidies. The comrades bought a billion dollars worth of wheat. The U.S. government paid $750 million to facilitate the sale. Congressman Ben Blackman computed the total cost of the grain steel to the American public. He found that according to figures supplied by U.S. Controller General Elmer Statz, the massive grain deals with the Soviets quickly raised domestic prices of wheat from about $1.63 a bushel to nearly $4.50 a bushel. The statistics estimate that the minimum cost to consumers of wheat and other flour-based products amounted to $300 million during the first nine months after the steal. By sending the cost of feed into the stratosphere, the looting of American grain added $1.5 billion to the meat bills of American housewives during the same nine-month period. The congressman calculated another $800 million in added costs to consumers for poultry, eggs, and dairy products. In addition to the $300 million of your taxes that went to the wheat wheelers and dealers, there was another $400 million for which we were looted in transportation subsidies. Well, naturally, the Russians didn't pay cash, but financed the grain steal by a loan of $750 million from the Commodity Credit Corporation. The interest rate, 6 and one eighth percent, is lower than what it cost the U.S. Treasury to borrow the money in order to make the loan. As a result of this looting of our grain, costs went up everywhere in the American economy. The $750 million credit was paid off in deficit dollars, adding greatly to inflation. Freight rates on the railroads had to be increased by about 10 percent, and the movement of the wheat precipitated a freight car shortage unknown in the history of this country's railroads. Chaos was created for every other industry attempting to move its products, and that too raised costs. More directly, wheat shipments to the Soviets have caused a price surge at home, which greatly increased the price of flour our bakers must buy. This resulted in a large number of bankruptcies among the independent bankers, which, so far, have cost 10,000 jobs. Other major losers were U.S. farmers, who had lost at least $120 million on the steel by September of 1972. Breeders were killing chickens because they could not feed them and still sell at a profit in the price-controlled market. And dairymen were sending milk cows to the slaughterhouse because they couldn't make a profit on price-controlled milk after paying the exorbitant price of feed. Congressman Blackman concluded, quote, if we sum up the cost of the Soviet grain deal to the American public, then we reach a sum which for the nine-month period exceeded three billion dollars, end quote. But by this time that figure has nearly doubled, making the cost of putting bread on the tables of Moscow about a hundred and sixty dollars for every family in America. 
Do you think a national referendum authorizing such a proposition would pass, especially if it were known that thanks to the generosity of the American taxpayer, bread is 10 cents a loaf in Moscow and 60 cents a loaf in Los Angeles? Looting America can be very profitable or very costly, depending on which end of the deal you find yourself. By this time, you should not be too surprised to learn that the Red Chinese and other communist countries have also been let in on the looting of American food. The Los Angeles Herald Examiner for July 27, 1973 carried an article headlined, quote, Russia, China, and Cuba to get food credits, end quote. It reported, quote, Congressional conferees Thursday tentatively agreed to authorize low-interest, long-term credit sales of food to Russia, China, Cuba, and other communist countries. The conferees accepted a Senate provision to lift, except for North Vietnam, the ban on food for peace sales to communist countries. Repayment under such deals can extend 20 years, with interest rates as low as 2 percent." So, at a time when the cost of food for the American people who must pay cash for it is going up at the rate of 2 percent a month, the communists are being permitted to loot us of our food on sneak-away credit at 2 percent interest per year. At the current rate of inflation, a 2 percent loan to be paid back in 20 years means that such food is virtually free. Our files are full of clippings predicting worldwide food shortages and rationing in the not-too-distant future. The American people had fistfights over gasoline. What do you think it will be like when the supermarkets are empty? You doubt it? Consider the following report from Paul Scott, Washington's most reliable correspondent. Assistant Secretary of Agriculture Carol Brunthaver is now in Moscow negotiating a massive new food and feed grain deal. Brunthaver took to Moscow a copy of the Senate's version of the administration's farm bill scheduled to be voted on in the Senate during the month to show Soviet leaders the windfall in it for them. This windfall provides for Russia's obtaining U.S. food through Public Law 480, the original Food for Peace program, for virtually nothing. Russia would pay for the grain in its own currency, which would have to be used on projects within the Soviet Union. Members of Congress and the nation's farm leaders are being privately told that if the Nixon administration has its way, there will be no reversal of this policy of furnishing cut rate and free food to Moscow and Peking. In a little publicized speech to the 1973 National Agricultural Outlook Conference, Brunthaver clearly outlined this policy decision, stating, Let me emphasize that the decision for an export-oriented agriculture has already been made. It is already being implemented and has been for some time. The machine is rolling and we are not going to throw it into reverse. One reason is that this policy satisfies human needs and desires in many countries. Another reason we are not going to reverse it is our balance of trade. The wide-ranging impact of this policy decision on the country's food reserves is spotlighted by Brunhaber's report that, quote, U.S. wheat exports in this marketing year are equivalent to three-fourths of the 1972 crop. Soybean exports exceed one-half of last year's crop. Feed grain exports will total over a billion bushels." End quote. This sort of thing is already in motion. According to a dispatch from Hong Kong, on August 22nd of 1973, the United States, during 1973, sold the Red Chinese on credit some 3.2 million metric tons, that's 126.7 million bushels of wheat, 950,000 metric tons of soybeans, and 630 metric tons of corn. The Department of Agriculture has refused to comment on the report that the Red Chinese have bought 120 million additional bushels of corn. Meanwhile, the U.S. Agriculture Department's Outlook and Situation Board estimated that by July of 1974, our wheat reserves would be at the lowest level since 1947. One arrogant Russian trade minister has even offered to resell us some of the U.S. grown wheat from Russian supplies. 
And if this happens, the Soviets will make a profit of about $4 a bushel on looted wheat we Americans were taxed to subsidize to them in the first place. It took Nixonomics and a foreign policy of capitulation and conspiracy to put this land of plenty in the position of begging a few of its own crumbs from the communists. Of course, it is not just the communist countries that get free lunch from Uncle Sam. The Los Angeles Times of April 22, 1973 reveals, quote, At present, the United States contributes about $380 million worth of food aid to underdeveloped areas annually and another $700 million or so in credit sales to friendly countries. America's vast ability to produce food is one of our greatest assets. If the government will get out of the food business, our farmers can and will produce enough food to feed the United States and still export billions of dollars worth of food each year. There is nothing wrong with selling food overseas as long as it is a genuine sale and not a credit sneak away or outright giveaway at the expense of the American taxpayers. But, tragically, our government seems to be committed to giving away not only our food, but more and more of our substance of every kind as part of a deliberate plan to loot America while strengthening the communist world in anticipation of a new world order, a great merger into a world superstate. Yes, we are being looted, pushed to our knees and looted. Unless something is done, and done soon, we will, in a generation, have prostrated ourselves before a ravenous world and surrendered our wealth and our liberties to join the slave camps of the would-be masters of the new world order who even now have their boots on our necks.